Hi, my name is Amy Dunkel from the Soils Foundation of Orange County. I'm just going to provide you with a basic naloxone training. We have a law in California, Assembly Bill 635, the Overdose Treatment Act, uh, that allows people to carry naloxone and administer naloxone and it, in the event of an emergency, and it protects them both cr criminally and civilly from practicing medicine without a license. Uh, we actually work under the Souls Foundation, work under the standing order of Dr. David Dahimi, but we now have a state standing order, so um, it's much more easy to access naloxone and distribute naloxone. Naloxone Narcan, it's the same drug, it's an opioid antagonist. Uh, it reverses an opioid overdose. It works for approximately 20 to 90 minutes and it will put somebody who's opioid dependent into withdrawals, which can be very unpleasant. I mean, we're saving a life, but it will make somebody who is uh, the person we're, we're reviving, um, if they are dependent on opioids, it's not gonna be a pleasant experience for them. It doesn't get a person high and it's non-addictive. Addictive. It's a very safe medication. It's been around 50 years and it is used in delivery rooms uh, on newborn babies. So if a mom is given an opioid at delivery and it crosses over to the baby, they can sometimes be born struggling to breathe and they're given naloxone. So it's a very safe medication. If you were to give it to somebody who isn't overdosing on an opioid, it would do nothing to them. It's literally just to spray up their nose. We're using the nasal, uh, nasal Narcan. How it works is we have an endogenous opioid system. When we take an external opioid, uh, the, it, the opioids bind to the receptors. Too many opioids on too many receptors simply shuts down the breathing part of the brain. And what naloxone does when you administer it in a timely fashion, it goes in, it knocks the opioids off the receptors, and then it binds to those receptors, blocking them for between 20 and 90 minutes. So whatever opioid is in the system, it cannot um, reach those receptors. And in that time, while the Narcan's on the receptors, hopefully uh, the potency of the uh, opioid will dissipate in that time. So sits on the receptors for 20 to 90 minutes, uh, then it will slip off. And when it slips off, the opioids reattach. And in most cases, the opioids reattach and the person will be okay. But we occasionally have a situation, especially with long acting opioids like um, like methadone and other long-acting opioids, that when the, opi when the Narcan slips off, the opioids reattach and there's this potential that the person can go out again. So we always want you to call 911. You know, Narcan buys you 20 to 90 minutes, but we want medical help. Uh, what are opioids? We know um, heroin, morphine, methadone, oxycontin, oxycodone, hydrocodone, fentanyl, buprenorphine, the list goes on. It works on all opioids. What we didn't anticipate in 2015 when I started to do this training is we begin to find opioids in the form of fentanyl in the cocaine, in the methamphetamine, in the benzodiazepines, and in certain pills. Um, you know, fentanyl is a huge problem. We lost 48,000 people in this country, approximately to opioid overdoses last year, and two thirds of those deaths were were related to synthetic opioids, namely fentanyl and its analogs. So we don't know anymore. I mean, we don't know um, whether we have fentanyl in a substance. Uh, we do provide fentanyl test strips, but you know, you can't tell by looking at a substance. Um, so the rule of thumb is if you find somebody overdosing, you're not sure what they've taken, you're gonna give them Narcan in the hope that it will get the opiates off the receptors and get that person breathing again. What puts people at risk of an overdose? Any mixture of drugs makes them more likely to overdose. Variation in strength and purity. We now have a very potent substance in most of the substances that are being used right now in the form of fentanyl. Uh, mode of administration. Uh, obviously, you're at more risk if you inject a substance, but with fentanyl, um, we're seeing more people going out smoking and um, snorting it. Uh, it, it you, you can die uh, because it's just so potent. Uh, what kills most people that we... Um, most of our children die as a result of tolerance changes. So getting out of jail. When somebody gets out of jail with an opioid use disorder, they're 120 times more likely to overdose in the, in the first uh, month than the general population. And most of those overdoses uh, will be in the first two weeks. Uh, people coming out of rehab. So an abstinence-based treatment program, uh, they complete the program and uh, we see many people relapsing after being in an absence-based program, uh, they're very susceptible because their tolerance has gone down. Uh, leaving hospital, you know, people going in for treatment of abscesses uh, for an overdose and they've had a period of not using, they leave and um, use and their tolerance is reduced and uh, they can suffer a fatal overdose. Neuroexperimenting drug users are 
obviously at risk, especially when we're talking about fentanyl being in so many substances now. Using a loan um, it, to be discouraged, you know, we can't save somebody's life if they're using on their own. We have to be there to administer the naloxone. And if physical health is compromised, if people are hungry, if they're thirsty, they're more likely to overdose. What does an overdose uh, of an uh, what does an opiate overdose look like? Basically, it's a change in responsiveness. Uh, you know, we never assume anybody is sleeping. If somebody's nodding out, we always shake, shout to see if they respond. Uh, I, I've reversed two overdoses with Narcan. The first was a gentleman sitting on a bench and there were long gaps between his breaths so his colour was good. He didn't look like he was dying but he was dying of an overdose. His, there would have been longer and longer gaps between his breathing um, and his heart would have stopped once he stopped breathing. So you never assume anybody is sleeping, shake, shout. Uh, with fentanyl we're seeing very rapid overdoses so we're seeing people turn blue very, very quickly, turning purple. Uh, and sometimes you can tell by the sound, you know, people, there's this gurgling noise, the death rattle, gurgling, uh, snoring noise. So it can be noisy or it can be silent. It could present with color being good or it can present with color being blue or purple. But it all boils down to responsiveness. Shake, shout, if they don't respond to that, we inflict pain in a humane fashion. Um, if it's somebody you find lying in the street, you don't know who the person is, gently kick the soles of their feet before you get down and start you know, just calling, uh, shouting their name or shouting something at them, shaking them. Um, and if they don't respond to that, it is a medical emergency. The way we inflict pain is the sternum rub, a humane method of inflicting pain. We take our knuckles and we rub firmly on the, the breastbone. So um, it's called the sternum rub. If you can't get to the sternum, you can rub the upper lip. You're inflicting pain in a humane fashion to see if they're responsive. If they're not responsive to pain, then it truly is a medical emergency. Uh, we try and call 911 as soon as possible. Uh, when I'm in a group of people, I assign one person the role of calling 911. You don't want a whole bunch of people calling 911 together. If I'm on my own, I call 911 and put it on speakerphone so I can focus on the person um, who needs the help. When I call that operator, I'll tell them as much as I can uh, that the person is not breathing, they're unresponsive, and that I suspect it could be a, a possible overdose. We want help and we want them to bring Narcan with them. Uh, using naloxone, so it's basically a spray up the nose. We're talking about nasal Narcan, and uh, it, each box of Narcan comes with two doses. They also have really good instructions on the box. You take out the Narcan, you peel it back, take it out, careful not to press it until you're ready to use it. You hold it with your fingers on either side and your thumb on the base. You want the person on their back, or at the very least, you want their head tilted backwards. You insert the nozzle into their nostril, and when it's into the nostril, you spray. And this fine mist will come out and go to those receptors. If they're not breathing in two minutes, uh, we give some rescue breathing or chest compressions in between. And uh, two minutes later, if they're still not responsive, we take the second dose. So a whole new dose, we start again, we take it out, we hold it the same way, but we insert it into the opposite nostril. We alternate nostrils between doses and we're very cautious not to press it until it's actually inside the nose because we don't want to waste that medication. Once you sprayed it, that's it. It can't be used again. So alternate nostrils, rescue breathing or chest compressions in between. Make sure somebody's called 911 and we stay with them at all times. We never Narcan somebody and leave them. Um, what you're doing is if somebody's opioid dependent, you are using Narcan to get them breathing again, but you're also uh, it, they will go into withdrawals um, and they need to be watched carefully in case they uh, vomit, uh, aspirate. So it's really important we stay with them. Rescue breathing, really straightforward. Uh, lie them on their back, make sure there's nothing in their mouth. You tilt their head back, um, lifting their chin. Pinch their nose shut and then give them two quick breaths, making sure the chest is rising. Um, and then one slow breath every five seconds. Um, chest compressions. The most important thing is to get certified, know how to do these things, because you never know when you can save a life. Uh, when we have administered naloxone um, and we've got somebody who's responsive and um, they're feeling unwell, we put them in the recovery position. And this is really important for any medical emergency to know how to put somebody in the recovery position. So we put them on their side with their knee up and we make sure that their t head is tilted backwards to keep those airways open. Um, and that prevents them, the knee up prevents them from rolling onto their back or their stomach um, where they could throw up and aspirate and the head tilted backwards keeps those airways open. So really important um, that you put them in the recovery position if they are feeling sick or unwell and while you're waiting for paramedics to get there once they're breathing on their own.
Stay with the person when you've given them the Narcan. If they don't respond after two to three minutes, uh, you give them a second dose. If necessary, a third dose, but waiting two minutes if you can. Know that it's very difficult to have a concept of time. You know, if you administer it in under two minutes, it's not going to make it work any faster. Um, and know also that the more you give, the worse the withdrawals. And we're trying to be as compassionate as possible. Um, in between doses, if necessary, rescue breathing or chest compressions. When they wake up, explain to them what's happened and explain in a compassionate way. We want to stay with them. We don't want them to um, be Narcanned and get up and run away because we know that there's a potential that when the Narcan slips off uh, 20 to 90 minutes later, the opioids could reattach and they could go out again. And if they've run off and they're on, or on their own, there's nobody to save them then. So, you know, we treat them with care and compassion and understanding. One of the side effects of naloxone is withdrawal symptoms, which are incredibly unpleasant for somebody who's opioid dependent. These are temporary, you know, that when the Narcan slips off, the opioids reattach. Aftercare, we discourage the person, obviously, from using more of any substance to make those withdrawals go away. Nothing can knock the Narcan off the receptors, you know, you you um, literally, unfortunately, have to ride it out for about 30 minutes. And it's a very unpleasant experience, as I say, for somebody who's opioid dependent, but it's just to be got through because if they were to add more substance to the mix, it can't, uh, can't attach to the receptors. Uh, and when the Narcan slips off, they've doubled their chances of going out again. So really important. And know and remember that the effects of the opioid are usually longer than the effects of the uh, naloxone. Naloxone slips off, opioids reattach, and there is that potential that they could go out again. So we want to make sure that 911 has been called and that somebody is with them at all times. So just running over that, check responsiveness, shake, shout. If they don't respond to shaking and shouting, inflict pain in the form of a sternum rub to see if they respond to pain. If they don't respond to pain, it is a medical emergency. If you have the Narcan there, get straight to it and make sure that you, they have their first dose of Narcan. Um, make sure somebody has summoned 911. Don't shout it out to a group of people. Select one person to call 911. If you're on your own, make sure you have it on speakerphone. Um, rescue breathing. And remember, if you don't have Narcan, you can keep somebody alive just by breathing for them or doing chest compressions till 911 has uh, arrived. Remember the recovery position on their side with their knee up and their head tilted backwards. Keep their airways open and prevent um, them vomiting and aspirating. Aftercare, stay with them at all times and, and just, you know, just be kind and compassionate. Carrying and storing naloxone, it should be kept at room temperature. We don't want it left in hot vehicles for any period of time. Never goes in the refrigerator. It should be kept between about 59 and 86 degrees. Any questions, if you need training, we're at the edge every single Sunday at 10 o'clock um, and you can contact me for more training opportunities. Um, and that's, it's as simple as that, you know, one, two, three, how to save a life. Thank you so much.